It's good to see you come back. So, as I told you, I will be reviewing different series. So, here's the first one I'd like to introduce you to. It goes by the title, Ten Count. It's a six-book series that was written and drawn by Rahito Takari, published by Sublime Manga. He's also known under this name as the author of Seven Days and Vanillers. I'm not gonna lie, I likely butchered that, but I could not find a pronunciation for it. So here's the cover of it, and I've actually read the first book of it, and it seems pretty good, so I'm gonna go ahead and say I'd recommend it. It's only three books, I believe, if the article I found was right. She's currently still actively working as an illustrator, it seems, and she write, uh, she publishes Shonen under the name Octo. After reading the series that I'm about to review, I really hope she continues in this genre. Some fun facts about her. She's from the Hiroshima Prefecture, she has an O blood type, and she is a Libra. So let's get right into a brief warning, just on some subjects that I like to get out of the way. Some of the themes in this manga include some I guess in the non-manga world or anime world, it would be C and C. It is kind of explained away in exposure therapy speak that I'll explain once it comes up. Some inappropriate relationship with a healthcare professional and a client. That is kind of the entire plot. But again, I, I wouldn't take these warnings very seriously. The only warning I would actually kind of push on is that there is implied trauma of a minor. I will say nothing happens physically to the minor. It's only a flashback because you can't have a main character in a manga not have a traumatic backstory. But again, I will warn you when they come up. But again, nothing is actually seen. It is all kind of implied. So, let's go ahead and jump right in to book one. For book one, our main characters are Tadomi Shirtani, a reserved and quiet man who suffers fairly intensely from OCD and germophobia. Then we have Riku Kuros. I'm hoping I pronounced that name right. If not, please let me know in the comments. I try to look for pronunciation guides and they weren't really helpful. Some had him say one way and the other the other way, and they both were kind of uploaded. So it didn't really help. <laughs> I may also end up shortening their name. More to save myself from getting tongue-tied. Book 1 starts off with Shirotani's boss, Mr. Kuramoto, nearly getting hit by the truck. But luckily he is saved by Kuros. While in the hospital, Thanks are given and repayment comes up, but of course, Kuros being the chat he is, he refuses, but he seems to hone in on Chiritani. The topic of his disorder comes up and it's clear by his demeanor that he's adverse to everything. Well, everything in life. Somehow he convinces the guy to go to a nearby cafe with him. This is where the title of the series comes up. Kuros asks him to write down 10 things he's adverse to. And I'll go ahead and list them. 1. Touch a doorknob barehanded. 2. Allow someone else to touch something of his. 3. Buy a book from a store. 4. Hold the handle on a train. 5. Eat meals out. Looking back at my notes, this is not what that word looked like. I am so glad I can read my own handwriting. 6. Shake bare hands. 7. Hold someone else's stuff barehanded. 8. Drink from someone else's cup. 9. Invite someone over to his place. 10. Is intentionally left blank. Heroes claims once he can complete all 10, he'll be cured. 10 is left blank as it's not needed to be known yet, but Shiritani promises to tell him when they get there. While the scene is wrapping up, Shiritani is asked to attempt number 1 on his list, so at Kuros takes his time paying for the bill. He stands there awkwardly hyping himself to open the door, but he manages to do it, just barely, and then he is told that he cannot wash his hand after. 
which is really the big feat of it all. It doesn't take long before they meet again to try another item on the list. Instead of going on order, they attempt number three, buying a book. Rose reassures him that things don't have to go in order. And while it's more common that way, each person is different. It's at this moment that Shiratani starts to appear curious about him. Motive and a small hint of, I wouldn't say desire, but the need for his attention. They end up picking a book called Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. Final little tangent is that this is a book I really wanted to try to teach myself to read in Japanese, brute force style. But while well, seeing a copy in Japanese was almost $60 with shipping alone, I ended up dropping that idea. Here, however, is our first red flag, as Shiratani's first few successes are tied to Kuros instead of his own strength, which is an innocent red flag to Shiratani. But still, if you end up having successes in your life when you're struggling mental health-wise, it's good to have people to help you and to guide you, but in the end, you're the one that made that leap. Give yourself some props. As the next chapter starts, we are introduced to Mikami, a friend of Shiratani that works in the baking part of his company. Of course, while still at work, he gets a text from Crows about going to get coffee in two weeks. This makes him giddy. At this point, I couldn't tell if he was just happy to see him again, or if because he tied his success and feeling of progress to him. Also, this is where we get our first of, of a, quite a few time jumps in the series. For two weeks later, with Shirtani and Kuros waiting for the train, it turns out he hadn't been on one since he was a teen. Like most people with strong phobias, his mind starts to cycle through panicking thoughts. But for the most part, he's doing fine. Until someone sneezes next to him. This sends him over the edge, and he starts to both mentally and physically shut down. Which I don't blame him. You sneeze on me, we're probably gonna have problems. Anyway, yet Kuros is right there by him, asking him if he needs an ambulance, if he'd rather fall on the ground, or collapse on him, mindful that any option could make it worse. After all, I have to assume that probably falling on the ground would be like the top worst, ambulance second, and probably have not as bad. I mean, he's still a stranger at this point, but it is what it is. Anyway, he does end up passing out because he's dramatic and has a phobia, but you know, never mind. <laughs> when the story picks back up, he realizes he's in a clinic. In fact, he's in Kuros' clinic. For a brief moment, he panics over the idea of never being able to go out. This is also where it's clear that Kuros is developing something for him, as they nearly kiss during an emotional exchange of fear and disappointment. But he quickly claims he thought he saw something on his eyelash. Okay, fear bud, because I also get in my homie's face in kissing distance when they have something in their eye. Okay. Soon, Shiratani is sent back on his way home, and Kuros ends up calling him, luckily somehow right as he gets home. He tells him that he needs to try these things with other people. At first, Shiratani thinks he's growing bored of him, but he tries to shake this thought off, which I have to take a moment to say those thoughts are so familiar to me. As someone that struggles with their mental health and paranoia, it brought back familiar worries of, that I've had in my own life. A simple do this thing with someone else, you start to wonder if maybe you've overstayed your welcome. Anyway, Shirtani, however, does as he's told, like a good boy, and asks Mikami to go out with him. To eat, that is. Which does shock Mikami to the point where he doesn't believe him, but it only lasts for a frame. We open up to the next chapter with Shirtani explaining the previous chapters to him. Sort of. I'm gonna assume he left out the part where he was developing feelings. Probably. This admittedly is where I got confused. Their time ends and he tries to drink after his friend drinks from his own cup. After all, his phobia is fairly well known in the office. So often when they go out together, as co-workers sometimes do, they often, often finish his drink. After all, it's not like he drank from it. Waste not, want not. I swear he did drink from it, but maybe the author just got me good and he didn't. You'll see why this is relevant in a moment. 
We have another time skip within this chapter of a full month. Even Kuros is shocked that Shiro hadn't gotten contacted with him yet. Both are very clearly missing each other, but suddenly they end up meeting outside a cafe after Shiro had a coffee with Mikami. Things get awkward, but Shiro gleefully tells him that he's drank after someone and he goes out so often. Kuros offers that if they can shake bare hands, then clearly he's improved well. They do, but instead of being a joyful moment, Kuros takes it as a sign that he's not needed and offers him congrats before leaving. This, of course, sends our boy Shiro back to square one and he's left there crying at the realization that he just sent this man away. And that is the summary of book one. We start off strong in book two as no one can get a hold of Shiro. It turns out that his progress was a bold-faced lie, as he just went and impressed Kuros. Another relatable thing happens when the guy finally checks his phone to see that Kuro wanted to meet with him at a cafe five hours earlier, but in a panic he shows up fully disheveled, which is alarming, as he almost always shows up well put together. Things are tense and Shiro ends up storming off. However, he loses his wallet doing so. Some blocks away, Kiro catches up to him and they talk some more. It takes zero time for Kuros to realize Shiratani has abandonment issues and that because he wasn't making any actual progress in that time, that's why Kuros had him in around him. Shockingly, they hug, likely because it had been raining and Shiratani was soaked and cold. This is also where Kuros explains the reason why he had been avoiding him. That's her to develop feelings for the man, and that he knew it wasn't proper of him. Which, like, good for seeing that, but also red flag? Oh well. Like I said, we're here for plot, not realism. Before they depart, Kuros says he's going to try to convince him to love him. But ask if that's okay, in which Shirtani gives a non-answer, which is uh, common in this book series. And I'm neutral on the whole convincing someone to love you sort of trope, as I can see some people may not like it, but I mean, it's not like he's locked up in a tower where he's unable to leave. If he really wanted to, he could send this guy going and never speak to him again. It's also this chapter where Shiro Tani realizes they're both men and that makes him ha, gay. <laughs> Another short time skip, unsure of how much, but I'm assuming it's within the same week. Chris can uh, cancels on their next date as he has to cover for his co-workers clients. Shiro Tani still ends up visiting the clinic anyway because mildly clingy, but it's cute. I will not and cannot describe the scene that follows as it's rated you're looking good. Y'all will have to just read it. In the following chapter, this is where we get our first warning that I mentioned earlier. Inappropriate uh, conduct in front of a minor. We don't quite get a clear picture of what's happened, but we see that something has changed. Quick quickly coming back to reality, things are tense as clean clothes are offered to Shiratani. But it's clear the man is still processing what just happened between them. Kuros once again asks to go out with him. Shiratani is annoyed, yet in the next page, he shows up anyway. They end up going to a fancy place, and Shiratani is comfortable enough to start drinking alcohol. I'm sure you can already see where this is going. You know what's not a good time? Trying to process deep mental strife while buzzed. Don't do it. You'll never enjoy the outcome. Shiratani is trying to process his last lack of self-worth. He both thinks Kuros is trying to manipulate him and that he could go back to his old habits, yet he doesn't want to and that confuses him. But it's finally starting to click in him. It's not the germs he's worried about, it's the filth in his mind. He's the filth. It's very clear a part of him is desperate for both human contact but also connection. Yet the fear of ruining another human being is in the way. They both end up going to Kuros' apartment, which is a rather big deal as he's essentially never been in another person's home. This is another part where I have to give a warning. Boundaries are pushed past their spoken limit. This is one of the many times this will happen. 
So if unrealistic but still well enough written CNC scenes bother you, I cannot suggest the series. But I would also say maybe give it a try. But I will say Shiratani is never actually depicted to be in physical pain, which I sadly, sadly have to say is an improvement in this genre. I'd miss this scene, we do see contamination actually start to appear to Shiratani. Which is a nice added effect, I think. It really drives in the home the fact that it's a physical thing for him. While we may not, or even Kuros may not actually see it, to him it's everywhere. Afterwards, they speak. Kuros asks Shiratani to depend on him, in which he agrees again. It's good to rely on people for help with mental health, but for the love of gods, my personality disordered friends, do not do this. This is unhealthy. It's good to have someone be there to support you and all, but maybe you don't fully depend on them for your recovery. That's- it's not gonna happen, and it's not gonna end well. Seek help. <laughs> Something to note in this final chapter of the book 2 is that his hair is considered childlike, and I wanted to focus on this for a good reason. When someone experiences trauma in childhood, they can basically go one of two ways, it seems. I'm sure there's a few other ways, but this is just what seems common to me. Either they mature, quote unquote, extremely fast and sort of drop out of a childlike mindset in order to protect themselves and also, well, parent themselves, or they never fully leave childhood. I believe this is what the author was showing, that, that while Shirotani on the surface is a mature and well-functioning adult, he can't emotionally mature past the point of where he experienced his trauma. We also get another hint that head past is somewhat connected to this trauma, which kind of threw me for a loop, I'm not gonna lie. We start book 3 with Shirotani wondering why he asked Kiros to touch him. Clearly, a part of him is determined to think that he doesn't need contact, when it's obvious he needs it. This book is heavy on the physical, so my notes are rather short, but some highlights I like to share are, Bruh is a simp. During one of the scenes, Shiratani asks Kiros not to laugh at him mid-physical, which again is painfully relatable. and. You know when it's a bad time to ask someone if they love you? Right after a physical, if you know what I mean. Don't do it. Calm down first. Relax. <laughs> Shocking no one, this boy is a track star, and by that I mean he literally tries to run away from the gay. Anyway, Bruce realizing the object of his desire is mature, and he of course calls to check up on him. Shiratani already taking some cold medicine because his fever, he blacks out mid-call. Which rightfully freaks out Kuros as he didn't even know the man was sick. Uh, this causes him to go over since he ended up with a spare key after they exchanged. I think the book called them wallets, but they look more like lanyards. This is when uh, Shiratani had dropped his on the ground and Kuros had offered his own since his was newer. But again, that might have just been a translation thing, cause, I mean, unless Japanese people do have more lanyard style wallets, which kinda cool, kinda jealous. After Shiratani wakes up and realizes Kuros is there, they chat for some time, and he asks him if he could count this as number 9 on his list if he didn't disinfect after he left, which of course the man agrees. When Kuros tries to leave, Shiratani stops him ask if he's o truly okay with him staying and getting infected by him. PSA time. I understand this is written pre-rona time, but for the love of god do not French people when they have a cold. Like it could have been such a sweet scene if they didn't lead up to that because the entire time I'm like, no, I'm not even germaphobe but I'm pretty sure if a partner of mine tried to kiss me while they're sick. No! <laughs> anyway, luckily it turns out it was a ruse as he just wanted to give him a piece of candy, which sadly he does spit out after Kuros leaves because that was just a boundary too far. But also, I kind of understand it, he did just bare hand that piece of candy and that would bother me too. 
Again, a trigger warning as we go back to a flashback. Again, imply that he witnessed his father. I'm going to be honest. I think she's meant to be a high schooler, but I could be wrong here. Either way, Chiritani watches his dad be inappropriate with a possible student. He's a uh, cram school teacher. Granted, he did have no idea his son was there watching, but like, dude, still. Anyway, the teenager catches him and shames him for something. Luckily, we return back to reality as Shiritani is asking Kuros about gay relationships, implying they must be different from hetero ones. Kuros assures him they aren't really that different. In the same chapter, they head to an aquarium as a date, or they would be dates if Shiritani would realize they are. I'm unsure of this next time skip as I believe it was a week or around next week around the same time they meet up to Netflix and chill. Poor Shirtani does not know what it means to go over and watch a movie with someone that you're, well, into. Ah, to be naive again. This book ends mid physical. And I only really mention that because it pretty much picks up right into next. We pick up with the fact that in the last book, Shiratani brought up Mikami purposely to try to see if Kuros would get jealous. I forgot to mention this as it was mid-scene at the end. A lot of important story bits happened during those times, so I may recap them. I may leave them out for you all to find if you want to check the series out. Shiratani keeps confirming that the man has daddy issues as he calls Kuros that completely unprompted. Kuros also admits to having a germaphobe kink, which, like, what? I get being supportive, but that's... Uh, I'm not really sure I would ever want that kind of support if I had a phobia. <laughs> but this makes Shiratani question, a phobia thrown out once he's cured. As Kuros explains his love to Shiratani, he has a flashback to when he was a child again. Kuros, seeing something is going on, he keeps on trying to press. It's clear that something's happened with his dad. Once again, Shiratani bolts from the situation and hides in a ba public bathroom, a place I have often run to hide to as well. Granted, it's usually from overstimulation and not, you know too excited to think right oh boy back to that good old trigger warning as we get a clearer picture of what happened to shiratani his father and the high school girl it turns out his dad was a single father the girl who i don't believe we know the name of yet had a thing for the teacher but realized shiratani was super close to him this seemed to make her jealous and grossed out Never mind a grown man wounded a teenager, but yeah, kids being attached to their parents. Weird. She convinces him to play hide and seek. Hirotani being a kid, he always goes to the same hiding spot, a cabinet in his father's office. He's exposed to adult behavior far too young, and his germophobia partially seems to be from paranoia that his thoughts can be heard. Another time jump as Shiratani finds himself in an elevator after delivering paperwork during a heavy monsoon. Of course, Kuros is also trapped with him, as his job has a branch in the same building. Things are tense, but Shiratani finally apologizes for what happened before. He had called him disgusting for what Kuros had done to him, but also he apologized for tainting him. I am so glad I have this entire series, as that's where it's left off. Just nothing more, not even a response from him. Starting Book 5, they both get into the same taxi after being freed from the elevator, but soon part ways before anything can be properly spoken about. Shiratani ends up chasing after him to finally speak about his fears and his paranoia fully. They end up going inside the apartment together. But it's finally at this point, Shiratani is able to say what he wants. The following scene is a little sketchy on consent. But it's kind of explained away as exposure therapy. Again, would I classify it as exposure therapy? Probably not. But I don't know. I just roll with it in this series. Just because it's kind of 
it's an entertaining idea, at least. Consensually, it's an entertaining idea. For once, I am overjoyed to have a flashback, or else I'd have almost nothing to say about Book 5, as it's... It's heavy on one subject. Anyway, this time, we have a flashback for Kuros. It shows he came from a neglectful home. Not outright abusive. Luckily, but his mother was a trophy wife who'd rather spend money than raise him, and his father was almost never home working. It shows he had a friend in an older adult, which I would have to say my red flags were going off, but luckily he's not a creep. I mean, weird, but not like white van driving down the road creep. Instead, it turns out this man is a germaphobe, and this was Kuros's first run-in with one. He did sort of rely heavily on him for any kind of adult attention. Remember what I said like two or three cents ago? Well, it turns out Kuros was the creep and tried to do something inappropriate. Luckily, the dude was like, what the hell, and told him to get out. I am so... So confused on why he would do this. Granted, I think he was depicted as a mid-aged teenager, so maybe that kind of conduct would have been known. But it's still something entirely unneeded and really my only gripe about this series. It just makes Kuros look like a predator now from everything he's done in the earlier books. Anyway, you could have paired him up with a much better option on having him leave instead of making the other or the love interest just straight up look like a predator from childhood. Anyway, after he disappears and it's kind of hinted that he may have um game ended himself. Kiro is left to his own entertainment, which he uses to read what he assumed was the man's favorite book given how worn down it was. It's that book that makes him realize his fear of losing him was what caused him to leave. Snapping back to reality, oops there goes gravity, Kuros is worried he messed up again. But at the same time, Shiratani doesn't understand why he wants him to push his own boundaries. But Kuros finally admits that he'd still love him even if he was cured. Because he lets him do things. Like not a great reason. But I mean, you do you, boo. I, I can't say it's a long-lasting reason, but I mean, find happiness where you can, I guess. For the first time, Kuros shows his own insecurity by asking him not to abandon him. Shiratani doesn't take him seriously at first, and before he could respond, his phone alarm goes off and they both drop the subject. But hey, Shiratani can drink coffee someone else has made now. Finally, in the home stretch, this book I zoomed through because of the drama. I am admittedly a sucker for drama. We open up to them going out again, but as they're making their way to a fancy hotel bar, they ran into f***ing Uda. I say this because apparently that's also that girl's name. I, I. The girl that was hooking up with Shiratani's dad, or she was being essayed by him. It, it's so weird. Again, I don't know her age, it doesn't say in the book. When she hears Kuros say Shiratani's name, she realizes who he is, and just casually invites herself out to drink with them, all while subtly taking jabs at Shiratani. While they are out having drinks, she keeps on shifting closer and closer to Kuros. And of course, she ends up comparing Kuros to Shiratani's dad, which is wrong on so many levels, it's not even cool. That's his daddy, not his dad. Get it right. This causes Shiratani to storm off, presumably to cool down. As he was upset from the very start, Kuros tries to follow after him, but Uda stops him, casually mentioning his quote-unquote unnatural attachment to his father. Luckily, Kuro isn't about that big <laughs> life, so he shuts her down with by far my favorite line in the series. I really hate easy boys <laughs> who are too eager to spread their legs for any man they meet. He said that right in her ear before rushing off to find his man. Which I have to admit, her retort also made me laugh when I first read it. 
what she said, he better not turn me on to some kind of new kink. Which like, girl, behave yourself. Next chapter, finally, after everything they've done so far, they have their first kiss. Which I wanted to kind of rag on, like, oh, you did all these things before you ever even kissed each other. But then I kind of remember that, like, on the gay aspect of the rainbow, there is the stereotype of moving super fast to do certain things, but yet taking a lot of time to do other things. So, like, I can't even say, oh, that's unrealistic. So I'm, I'm sure there are couples out there that have done this, which I don't judge you, do you, boo? As long as y'all happy, I don't care. But so, <laughs> granted, this must have been some mega kiss because they missed the reservation. Also, Shirtani admits his love and fear that if he fills out number 10, that he'll leave. Bros is shockingly left in tears. They, uh, do end up using that hotel room though, which the fact that the germaphobe was willing to shack up in a hotel room, I, I guess he's cured by the power of eggplant, you know. Granted, they did kind of use his jacket to make a shield, but like, anyway, I can't go to details. We do finally get what his number 10 is. You're not ready for this. It's head pats. The man can't handle head pats. I won't spoil why, mainly because again, I want to convince everyone to go read it, but I find it funny regardless. Gross believes Shiratani had fallen asleep after their fun, and explains how he's nothing like his first love, and that he loves him for it, and that if he could help Shiratani, that maybe he could right the wrongs in his past. Which I see with the problematic nature of comparing one love to another, but at the same time, I see the honor and dedication of wanting to do better by a new partner. After this all, a small time skip happens, Kuros ends up actually running into his first quote unquote love again. After a brief interaction, he leaves him with his new book signed. The author had no idea who he was until he was long gone. Shiratani stops for the clinic to see if Gross is in, but he's told by the director that he's quitting. Shiratani finds him and demands to know why. I'm not gonna lie, it didn't really make it clear, but I I partially kind of want to blame them on maybe translation issues. But it is what it is. You get told like literally a few pages later, but yeah, it was just kind of an odd pacing break. In the final chapter, Shiratani is finally able to tell Kuros that he loves him, and that it turns out that Kuros actually quit to return to his studies to specialize further, though he can't quite say why, because no one can actually say their reasonings in this <laughs> series. Shiratani can now buy books on his own at the bookstore, and in the very end, Kuros tells him to make a list, 1 through 10, of things Shiratani would like to do with him no matter how dirty. So, for my reaction. I have to say, for my first series on this channel, I did not make this particularly easy on myself. Which, I mean, I wanted to give a fair example of what I would be reviewing. While some may turn up their nose to certain tropes, it was clear the author did do some research on OCD and germophobia. A lot of the artwork depicted the rawness of hands that you might find on a germaphobe who is obsessively cleaning their hands. Even uh, scents are mentioned how things smell clean, things clean or smell like disinfectant. It was kind of a nice little touch that made it obviously seem like the author did do her research and didn't just slap on a fun little disorder and be like, oh look how quirky my character is. I really do wish she would have made a second series for the second list, but at the same time this felt like a nice enough ending. So now I'll give you my scores. For New War, I gave it a 2.5, and yes, I'll give 0.5s, especially for things that seem kinda minor or things that will probably come up again in the story, otherwise everything will be 5 out of 5 New War.
while there are some consent issues that could make a reader uncomfortable, there wasn't a lot of aggression in said acts. Nothing was, I'm dominating over you in that kind of cliche sort of way. That and I find the reason of exposure therapy kind of fun in a sense of it's not something you see often as an explanation. Would it work in real life? No, but it's still entertaining to read. Another point was for some very light DNS themes. Uh, again, very light, very, very, I wouldn't even really recommend this to someone that actually likes those themes, but it was there. Uh, half a point for the flashbacks because Boy, they came up during the most improper, well not improper, they made sense in the series, but it, it was just a weird juxtaposition of physical and then childhood trauma, which like, I guess, saying that out loud, I could see where they were coming from, but uh, yeah, but you know, it, so I give it a 2.5. It's not the worst I've ever read. It's also not the cleanest I've ever read. As for Spice, I gave it a rating of 4. So, so much physical. I think almost like two whole books I could barely cover because the majority was just that. So if you want something physical heavy, I fully recommend it. And also, it has some variety you may not expect in your average manga. Enjoyability, I give it a 4. Why? I genuinely love this story as I ended up actually binging it almost in one night when I very like I got all the books together. The character designs were nice, basic but well proportioned, no yaoi hands here. And while there was a height difference, it wasn't in the creepy there's no way this is a grown man kind of way. The story was fairly well thought out. My own gripe is that I wish it was longer. The plot with Tada showing back up could have been drawn out or maybe another love interest. While the drama between the pair was good enough, I feel like it could have added a little bit more spice to it if we had an outside source kind of pushing on to this couple. And would I recommend this? Of course. It ended up scoring a 10.5 on my scale, which would give it a, technically just barely, an A, which I feel like it deserves. It's simple, it's an easy read, there's nothing that I would think would upset too many people. Well, that it would be the end of this review, and I hope you actually take the time to check this story out. It's been a fun read, and it was fun telling someone else about it. Until we read again, I hope you have a good day, and you maybe leave me a recommendation of what you'd like to me to react to. Bye! This was probably the blooper part, as I'm technically eating and drinking something right after work as I'm recording this at almost 12.40 a.m. But uh, my food's off to the side, right? Because, well, I don't know why, really. Anyway, I leaned over to take a drink and a bite, and I'm just kind of over here like, I'm just, I just look like I'm really, really concerned. <laughs> Might even get a little sick. <laughs> look, it's the simple things, alright?